So let's get going again. So you've seen some of the charts I was pointing to. Let me give you a bit of a summary as to what I was um, referring to there. Now, basically, we've had a bit of a, um, a you know a sell-off last week. Um, we've pushed into what I would call the kind of cliff edge, um, and so far we've not fallen over the cliff. That cliff, for me, quite well defined in the S&P 500, and is 1800. They're sort of 1800 to 18. Um, you may be more specifically, a sort of um, 1820 kind of area. It's some pretty hefty support, and we've, we did dip down into the lowest in two years, uh, thereabouts in the S&P 500 last week, but we've rallied pretty strongly back. Now, if we look over to these other charts we were just looking at before, we can see that similar things have happened in Europe. Now, we've dipped below the 200-week moving average in Germany, um, but we pulled off, uh, bef you know, before we reached this low from October 2014, we've, we've reacted before we got there. Still a chance we can dip down there. That's my base case scenario that we probably do get down there. But at the moment, seeing a bit of a pullback off the lows, and we've kind of held this, this support here, which I had on the chart. Uh, we've obviously dipped through it, but we've closed back above it. and kind of reacted from this, um, this open to this, this lower candlestick here. Now looking at the FTSE as a basis for comparison, you can see we did make fresh three-year lows, but have seen a strong bounce back, and that's continuing through today. Part of what really sent us lower last week was this sell-off in financial shares. Um, it's, it's, if you pull up a chart of looking at the, the financial sector versus the um, FTSE 100, we, I, you know, I don't have a chart for the financial sector right here, but the general idea is that um, it, it's been massively underperforming the, the general benchmark, and uh, part of the reason is that we've been moving towards lower interest rates, and obviously recently uh, kicked off really by the Bank of Japan, um, we've seen a, a shift into negative interest rates, and Japan's 10-year yield, so the yield on their 10-year debt turned negative. So if you want to borrow for the next 10 years in Japan, uh, you actually have to pay for the privilege. So. So if you want, uh, you know, if you want to buy bonds for um, parking money in a safe area to earn an investment, you're actually paying for that privilege. So um, things have got pretty distorted, and that's not a great environment for banks because they typically try to borrow at the long, at the long end and uh, and then lend to you at the short end, making the the interest rate difference a um, bit, bit difficult when it's uh, negative at the uh, the end they want to borrow from. It it just confuses things. So today we're getting a bit of a bounce back. There's just been a few positive news items out of the banking sector. Today's example is that uh, HSBC, HSBC are staying in London. We had some decent earnings from Commerce Bank at the end of last week. JP Morgan chases um, Jamie Dimon um, buying, uh, uh, you know, uh, sorry, Morgan. Uh, yeah, J.P. Morgan's, uh, I was going to say Morgan Stanley, but it's too many Morgans. Um, it, the CEO has bought $25 million worth of stocks, showing some faith in the sector. So a few things supporting the bank shares there. They're lifting the FTSE today. And uh, Chinese markets have come back, but they haven't dramatically sold off to match the sell-off of last week, because obviously looking at those charts we just saw, we've actually come back quite a bit off the lows. Um, so not as much, if you take the aggregate of it, not so much reason for China to sell off dramatically. And um, probably the biggest news over the weekend was the interview release from the People's Bank of China governor um, just saying that um, – Essentially, that there are no plans to drastically devalue the yuan, um, but you can sort of see that from what they've been doing. They've been massively intervening to um, uh, sell dollars and, and buy up the yuan to keep its value. Um, they, they, they're trying to keep the yuan constant against a basket of currencies, and they're sort of, he sort of dismissed the dollar volatility as just a sort of a byproduct of that. Obviously, there's a lot of big hedge funds out there. Uh, who are actively shorting the yuan in a belief that China's slowdown means that their, co their currency should be worth less. And, you know, that's a large part of what's called the turmoil at the start of the year. Um, if 
the yuan can stabilize, perhaps even, um, <coughs> excuse me, you know, appreciate a bit over the next uh, week or so. I think that would improve sentiment, and you know, that could be a reason to build a bit of a base off that 1800 level in the S&P and other global markets. Now, I think I mentioned in this recording that Mario Draghi speaking at 2 p.m. GMT today. Have a quick look at the euro. Interestingly, with the euro in the in the massive sort of sell-off that's taken place, the euro has rallied. Um, largely, could be uh, the economic data from Europe hasn't been fantastic. Um, German industrial production saw a surprise drop. Uh, multiple other indicators that weren't too impressive. But uh, nonetheless, the euro picked up and declined at the end of the week, uh, matching the, the the jump in equities. And I think it's it's basically explained by the idea that um, in these kind of risk-off market environments, uh, European investors are pulling their money back into into Europe uh, from overseas. <coughs> What's the situation here? Well, if we pull the charts out a bit, you now we see that we're in this we're in this range. Now, obviously, now that we've broken out, um, the the opportunities for going long are slightly diminished. But still, uh, you would think that eventually, the default in this kind of range-bound environment is probably to try and rechallenge 115 again. Or uh, I have this line on there, which I think connects a few of the peaks quite nicely, is about 114.60. That, I think, would be the target, but we've seen a bit of a, a drop back off the peak of last week. Chance in the shorter term for a bit of a drop back. I think 110 is probably the, the real line in the sand. That's what, that's what we were bumping up against, 110, and we turned into this triangle pattern, and we got the dramatic breakout. So we'll have to see what uh, Mr. Mr. Draghi had to say, has to say later today. One of the interesting things about what's happened recently, and it happened, I think it wasn't necessarily this. It might have been actually the Wednesday. I can't remember if it was the Wednesday or the Thursday. But basically, Mario Draghi and Kuroda, the Bank of Japan governor, both um, – uh, one of them announced that there's a good chance of easing in March. That was Draghi. The other announced the negative interest rates. Um, but the, the yen and the euro did precisely the opposite of what they would have intended, um, i.e. going up, um, not particularly helping their uh, their exporters. So we'll have to see what the reaction is to uh, to Mario Draghi. If the euro jumps again, you know, he's really lost a lot of influence. And that, that was one of the main catalysts for European stock markets rallying was ECB stimulus and, and, and Draghi talking up the prospect of more stimulus. If he's lost that ability, it takes away a lot of the kind of catalyst for why European stocks are rising in the first place, which is evident enough because we're, at, uh, we, you know, we're now pushing into multi-year lows. Look at Sterling. Sterling has, has the most um, of the on the economic data calendar. Um, it's, it's, it's Sterling that kind of dominates this week. So that kicks off tomorrow when we've got um, inflation data out. CPI obviously meant to remain pretty at pretty low levels um, given the drop in, in oil prices, um, but nonetheless, uh, CPI year over year is expected to tick slightly higher to 0.3% from from 0.2% from um, in uh, in December. Then on, um, so we have the FMC minutes, which is obviously going to impact all dollar pairs on Wednesday. But we do have, before that, we've got the unemployment rate and the average earnings data on Wednesday. And we round things off for the UK with retail sales on Friday. So what we're looking for here, kind of technically, is for off this economic data is, is you know, reasons to, to to judge whether this, this rebound off the lows in the pound is, is sustainable. So what we've seen is a couple of doji showing indecision uh, right above the 140 mark, the 140 handle, a big bullish breakout. Then we pulled back from this um, this peak from, uh, from sort of April 2015, come back, re-challenge the breakout area, and close back even. So at the moment, uh, to me, it, it, it is on the, on the bullish side. Um, we haven't broken to the top side, but that is quite significant support. 
um, that held for a long time. We've broken it. We've retested it. Um, we've come back and challenged, but there's a chance we can push through. But if we can't, then that's you know then the default. This, this really is the line in the sand for me. This sort of 146.30 type area. If we can't push through there, that to me is probably a rolling down belief 140. Uh, but if we can close a week up through there, um, then maybe this this decline is over. So we've, we've successfully challenged the breakout area, but we've not successfully broken above that uh, previous support and resistance. So that's that's the next, as I said, line, line in the sand really. Dropping down slightly to the the daily chart. Here you can see that kind of resistance building up <clears throat> right beneath the uh, the 146 level, and it's been actually consolidating with pretty narrow opens and closes right in at 145. So a bit of indecision about where this is going to go, but I think by the end of this week we'll have a much better idea. Um, not only have we got the economic data that I just mentioned. But actually, had quite a decent chance, supposedly, that um, PM David Cameron will have some sort of uh, deal uh, from from Europe, and uh, potentially set the date of the referendum. Now, the most, some of the most dramatic moves that we've seen recently have come from the yen. This is the weekly chart. This, I mean, this is fairly textbook. We've, we've got declining momentum. We've got a trend line here that first broke. We've got a, a, a run down to a fairly well-defined support at 116, a bounce, a retest of the broken trend line, and then just plummeted down right towards the next logical area of support that have actually rebounded since getting there. So to me, this is pretty much a topping pattern here. I mean, this is a sort of pretty rough shod head and shoulders reversal pattern. And, um, you know, there's a chance a few people get, could get caught offside around 116, but to me 116 is pretty tough resistance now. It was strong support. It should be strong resistance on the way back up. So if we can get anywhere close to it, that to me would be an area of possible weakness for, for dollar yen. Um, dollar yen correlates pretty well to stock market, so we'll have to see, uh, you know, if there's a massive return to some risk on sentiment. You know, if the Bank of Japan maybe managed to convince us they're able to do more than just the negative rates that they've done so far, perhaps more quantitative easing, then that could all work together to help dollar yen and then equities move higher. Mm -hmm. Now, crude, um, I think Brent is the most, uh, sorry, uh, WTI is actually the most obvious bottom, but I was looking at Brent today in the chart for him. But here you can see, circled here, basically a fake out to the bottom, and then just a nice rally up to the support, and then we've opened above that today, and we're pushing higher. So the next logical stop probably would be this um, declining trend line here, which kicks in around one, uh, around 31. And then I can probably get into a little bit more detail on Brent since that's what I updated today. And you can see that Brent's actually slightly outperformed basically rather than the lows um, that it rechallenged like WTI is basically just held off the, of 30. Uh, Brent's the international benchmark and $30 per hour is a round number and a few days couldn't get through it now we're pushing back up. And so I'm, my default assumption is couldn't push to the downside, tested the, um, tested the bears, they failed. Let's get up to the top and see if the um, see if the bulls can get us a breakout through through 35. Uh, if we can, I think that's probably a bit of a game changer in the intermediate tree, uh, in, the, in the intermediate term uh, through 35. You know, given the volatility in oil prices, could carry us pretty quickly to 40, 45. Gold, obviously, the other big mover. This is um, a weekly chart here. I mean, I'm showing a lot of weekly charts uh, this, this week, but it, I think it's just because the size of the, the moves that have been taking place actually requires me to scale out a bit just to um, to get, give them some context. So a lot of opportunity here. I mean, anyone who's long gold last week, well done. 
um, massive move higher. You know, we did allude to uh, in the chart forum this this fake out to the downside. The fact, you know, similar thing that I was talking about in. Um, uh, uh, from one of the other mark one of the other charts I've just looked at, where you get you know a marginally lower low, but really nothing too convincing. I think it was a, the year the UK 100. Um, but you know if if that's all you can do to the downside, then you know you're opening up um, a capitulation once we get back above there. Anyone who got short on a breakout is going to give up, and uh, you know that. People going long, um, and then people covering their shorts, buying it as well. It all adds up, and uh, that contributed to this massive move higher. So we've got this kind of channel that we're still we're still in. It's basically reacted from the top of that channel. But there's another kind of trend line here which connects uh, these two peaks, which we're testing at the moment. I think the fact that it breezed through it so well. Um, it was a bullish sign, but it's probably not going to be. It wasn't much resistance on the way up. Probably not much on the way down. We could get a drop through to um, around number 1,200, and then there we've got the peak here at 1 uh, 1 190. But back through there, and it would take the edge off a bit of this this uh, this bull run, uh, this uptrend. You know that could carry us all the way back down to one one hundred again. Uh, maybe opening up the idea of a um, of a uh, inverse head and shoulders triple bottom type pattern. Um, but uh, I think we probably do need to hold this one one ninety to to keep the momentum going. Otherwise, you know, uh, if equities are recovering, you know, sentiment improves, um, you know, this gold's going to fade pretty quickly. So that's it. Thank you for attending the, the webinar here. Apologies for the sound issues at the start. Um, hope that didn't affect you too much, but we're um, yeah, we're finishing a little early here. Try and keep it snappy. Um, thanks very much for attending, and uh, good luck with the trading this week.